Let us pray. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Creator, Redeemer, Sustainer, Victor, Conqueror, Warrior. Help our minds and our thoughts and our feelings. Shine in us, O Lord, that our thoughts and feelings would be delightful, pleasurable, approved by you. Help us to see things with the help and aid of the Holy Spirit. Help us to hallow and exalt your name over the human activities of academia. Help us to see to the bottom of issues, peering into souls, also appear as appearing into our own souls with your light and aid help us to repent as needed and to strengthen those things that are a good help us by thy all sufficient word and thy all sufficient presence in the name of the father son and holy ghost amen well Last time we were with Professor Dean Dixon on the history of the Church of England from the abolition of the Roman jurisdiction and it's 1549. Bishop Bonner has been tossed into Marshall Sea prison for contempt, deprived of his bishopric, sent back to jail. And that will shape him for the years to come when he earns the sobriquet, the moniker Bloody Bishop, Bloody Bonner, and may well be a member of the greeting committee in hell. But also in that time period, bread worshiping Mary is complaining about the act of uniformity, 1549. The council remonstrates her, and finally her brother gives her a dispensation to hold her cannibalism service. Foreign affairs are shaky in this period. Somerset is teetering and finally is overthrown. He goes to jail for a bit, but is let out. And let's not forget as we proceed, the bread-worshipping cannibal Bonner is sleeping on his straw mattress in Marshall C at prison. So we pick up there um, talking about the parliament. Now, persons were said to have contributed a hundred thousand pounds to the civil war to repay them 150,000 pounds in base silver was launched into circulation. Nor were honors and titles denied, ever sought in England. Nor a volume that's not permitted to rise in proportion with proportionate dignities. Thus Warwick was made Earl Marshal. St. John was created Earl of Wiltshire, Lord Treasurer. And Northampton Great Chamberlain Russell received the title of Earl of Bedford. Wedford Wentforth went with the office of Chamberlain of the Household, acquired from the Sea of London the vast manors of Stepney and Hackney. Paget was made Baron and gained the London House of the Bishop of Exeter, and much booty from the Sea and Chapter of Litchfield. Wingfield became comptroller in the place of Paget. <clears throat> in the parliamentary session, which began November 4, the first care of the victorious faction was to provide for their future safety against all such gatherings of the people as might lead to insurrection by a statute making it high treason for 12 persons or more assembled together to attempt to kill or imprison any of the council 
or to alter laws and treason or felony for them to continue together being commanded by proclamation to disperse. Under this statute, it may be observed it was that Somerset finally lost his life two years later. It soon appeared that no political reaction was to be expected from Warwick, though in his heart he was a partisan of the old religion. We got a footnote here, Halen, who remarks that Wentworth had now a goodly territory in London, from St. Catharines near the Tower to Blackwall, and from River Lee to Stratford Le Beau, six and twenty townships, streets, and houses. The bishops ventured on the 14th to draw the attention of the Lords to extraordinary immorality of the nation, which they alleged to be encouraged by the long suspension of the ecclesiastical laws. Their authority was impaired and traversed by the countless acts and proclamations <coughs> of the temporal powers. They could neither cite nor punish offenders. While the church was held powerless, every vice was grown to be enormous. The lords were not affected by these representations, and the bill, the bishops were encouraged to prepare a draft bill for ecclesiastical jurisdiction. But this, when they produced it, seemed too fair, favorable to their own authority. Warwick, who was seldom present, attended in his place to oppose it, and it was relegated to a committee of four prelates and seven laymen, to Cranmer, Tunstall, Goodrich, Sampson of Coventry, to Dorset, Wharton, Stafford, to the Chief Justice, the Chief Baron, and the Attorney General and Solicitor General. In a month, they prepared a bill which passed the Lords, but was lost in the Commons on the second reading. In the Commons, meanwhile, so great was the necessity of doing something. A curious scheme was progressing, which was that the ecclesiastical jurisdiction should be exercised, not by the ordinaries, but by students of the universities by four years to be admitted by the bishop, archbishop or bishop. This had already passed the commons and had been sent to the Lords December 3, where it in turn seems to have been lost. So we're talking about ecclesiastical jurisdiction in 1549. The only result of these various proposals was the renewal for three years of the nugatory statute, which had so often delayed the reader of this work for revising the ecclesiastical laws by a commission of 32 persons to be nominated by the king. That wandering clot of legislation, which had so often mocked the hopes of churchmen, was now, however, redeemed from mere nullity by the prescribed space of three years in which it was to take effect. For it had been hitherto cast over indefinite time and evermore neglected. It might seem strange that not less than ten bishops protested against it. And when men so different as Cranmer and Tunstall Goodrich and Aldrich, Ridley and Day, Farrar and Heath, Holbeach and Thoroughby were drawn together. Little was expected from the bill by the Episcopal order. There was in it a new clause that only four of the 32 were to be bishops. Four more were to be common lawyers. The liturgical reformation was advanced by two measures, an ordinal or the form and manner of making and consecrating of archbishops, bishops, priests, deacons, and other ministers of the church, 
was enacted to be set forth by 12 persons, six prelates and six other men of the realm, by the 1st of April next ensuing. This act was, a, was opposed by the leaders of the old learning, Tunstall, Aldrich, Thoroughby, Heath, got a footnote here, three and four Edward the sixth. Strip says that this would be 1550, 1551, that 32 were nominated at last in the third year of Edward by a commission dated October 3. But as the act got not through Parliament before 24 December, this commission must have been of the next year or even later. It was an important one. So we've got the, the leaders here. It will be observed that it provided for the ordination of ministers below the order of deacons, though to the incalculable loss of the Church of England, the liberty allowed has never been exercised. By the time appointed, the first English ordinal was ready and will await the reader in the proper place. This act was suppleted. The reign of uniformity was extended by another, a truly lamentable degree. Under a penal statute of one pound, four pounds, and four third offense, imprisonment at the king's well, will, the possession of any of the ancient service books was forbidden. The ancient service books were enumerated and recalled. The antiphoners, missals, grails, processionals, manuals, legends, pies, porches, primers, couchers, journals, ordinals, and all other books whatsoever in Latin or English, writ written or printed. Mayors and bailiffs were to deliver them up. Bishops and commissaries were to burn. deface or destroy them under penalty of 40 pounds of which half was to go to the informer and no delay or protection of law to be allowed. The only exception made was the authorized primer of Henry VIII. And this was to have all invocation of saints blotted out. The war with images was at an end, but still there remained many fugitives or prisoners in the refuge of private houses, and there were many, it would seem, still standing, though dilapidated in the places where they had been formerly worshipped. They too were ordered in this act to be destroyed, whether they be of stone or timber, of earth or alabaster, that monumental images might be spared, provided that the dead persons were now into a footnote again, three and four, Edward six, 12. The committees are empowered by this act to ordain the lower orders, that is, subdeacons, readers, acolytes, and the rest. For all these seem comprehended in the clause of other ministers of the church. So monuments provided that dead persons whom they represent had never thought or taken to be saints. This cruel edict was again opposed by Tunstall. He'll be involved in uh, Cranmer's deposition, I believe. Aldrich, Thoroughby, Heath, and Day, to whom the Bishop of Litchfield, Sampson, added himself and the lords of Derby, Stuarton, Morley, Windsor, and Wharton. And if it had not been enough, it was strengthened as it regarded the old books by a letter royal to all bishops to command their deans and prebendaries, their parsons, vicars, curates, and church wardens to deliver up all their antiphoners, missals, grails, and the rest then to deface and destroy them 
even as it should be with their own hands. Evil persons, the boy was made to say, give it out, since the apprehension of the Duke of Somerset, that they shall have their old Latin service back again, and their conjured bread and water, and their other superstitious ceremonies. As if the godly and uniform order now set forth were the act only of the Duke. It was set forth by Parliament. It was the act of the entire realm assembled together in Parliament. It was added that the Holy Communion was now often omitted on Sundays because obstinate persons refused to pay towards the bread and wine. It was therefore ordered that such persons should be punished by suspension excommunication and other censures of the church. The double goad was but too effective. The December Warwick was more fatal to the ancient cause than Somerset, the Calvinist. The various books which together made up the ancient uses of the Church of England, the precious stores of medieval, we have a footnote, this letter was December 25. We may remark on it that though the passing of the first prayer book by Parliament is twice spoken of, there is no mention of convocation or of the clergy in connection with it. The bishops to whom it was addressed would have known better if any of those ambiguous expressions had been used to them that are found in some other documents to tend to make it appear that convocation passed the book. The precious stores of medieval ritual were hunted and destroyed with a havoc which, in spite of the efforts of furtive piety, has made them rarer in the land of their production than cylinders of Babylon or other rolls of Egypt. In this session, some return to humanity might be remarked in the repeal of the horrible slave branding act of the beginning of the reign and the passing of more reasonable statute of laborers. Idle laborers in husbandry were still to be punished as vagabonds, but the infirm and aged poor were to be relieved and habitation provided for them by the devotion of the good people of the town where they were born or had lived three years. A general recommendation to show mercy, however, is of little efficacy. Would have been no need of new provision for the poor if the provision made by ancient piety had not been swept away. <clears throat> the chief effect of this new statute was that in the next summer, in a dearth, the starving people who had crowded up to London, give me a second here, thank you, up to London were driven forth by the proclamation and made to return to the places where they were born or had dwelt three years. For the rest, the Parliament attempted to check the disgraceful rascality and false dealing, which was almost closing foreign ports and markets against English products. It restored the coiner Sheraton to blood, and by the exception of heretics and Anabaptists from the general pardon with which its labors were concluded, it left the way open for the burning of Joan Boat Botcher. From the day of his memorable sermon, the Bishop of Winchester had remained in the tower, enduring, as he said, the great temptation of solitariness, able to make a man work by imaginations, the confusion of his wits, and vainly demanding justice. In vain, after four months, he had written a letter to Somerset. 
making an instance instance suit to have the benefit of the laws like an Englishman. This is Gardner. He's going to be visited in prison. And not to be cast into prison without bail or man prize, without accusation or indictment, without calling to any presence to be charged with anything. In vain, his servants had endeavored to introduce a bill into Parliament that his cause might be heard there. At length, when a year was expired, all but six days, it pleased the Lord Protector to send to him in the month of June some high visitors who bore in their hands the new prayer book. Look on this book, said Rich and Peter. It is a book passed by Parliament. Conform to it, and the Duke will ask mercy for you of the King. The Bishop had suffered much. He had, as he declared, received neither word, message, comfort, nor relief. No one had been allowed to see him, save that his chaplain, was admitted to pay him a single visit once when he had a fever. But he had borne all with patient silence. He now replied that he required justice, not mercy, being no offender. Were you not required to preach the king's authority in his nonage? Asked Rich. I was not, nor was it in the papers delivered to me, was the answer. Have you not disobeyed the protector's letters? Never. And if I had how many plain injunctions, to say nothing of the letters, made under seal and in open court are broken in this realm without punishment in this sort. But if I have, let me be tried on it and sue for mercy when my offense is shown. Look on this act of common prayer, proceeded the Lord Chancellor. See how dangerous it is to break the order of it. The penalties are severe. And yet no man can be troubled for that act unless he be indicted. Let me come abroad out of prison and I will see to it. Look in the book and say your mind to it, Rich insisted. The bishop answered that he could not go to school in prison nor would he appear to redeem his faults if he had committed any at the expense of his conscience. I will honor the law as a subject or pay the penalty. What more conformity can I show? Submit yourself to the Lord Protector. I refer myself not to the Lord Protector, but to the law, said Gardner, adding nobly. My body shall serve my conscience not my conscience, my body. The Lords then gave him a little more liberty to go into the gallery and left him promising that he should hear from them in a day or two. Month, however, passed on month and he heard no more. The protector fell, the parliament met, and then Gardner made a strenuous effort to regain his freedom. He wrote to the council congratulating them on their success, demanding a trial or else to be to be no longer in present prison on the warrant of a mere subject like himself. He wrote a second time, I have continued here in this miserable prison one year, one quarter, and one month, with want of air, want of books want of company, and want of just cause why I should have come hither at all. The Lords took this letter in good part and laughed very merrily at it, saying he had a pleasant head. The third time Gardner wrote a more serious expostulation, but he remained where he was. The other imprisoned bishop also made the fall of the protector the occasion of an attempt for liberty. And from Marshal C. Bonner issued a supplication to the king 
with a letter to the council in which he affirmed that his sufferings arose from the malice of the Duke of Somerset, who was, like Smith, his deadly enemy. In handling him, Bonner said they had observed neither. Now we got a footnote. I've shortened this curious conversation from Gardner's answer to the articles afterwards brought against him. Bonner said they observed neither law nor order, but extremity, shutting him in prison and preventing him from prosecuting his appellation to the king. But he gained nothing. A new commission, indeed, of courtiers and lawyers headed by Rich was appointed to examine his papers, but they merely confirmed the former findings and the bishop remained in prison the rest of the reign, 1549-1553. His denouncer, the determined Hooper, was now one of the leading lights of London, had trembled or imagined that he trembled for a moment when he heard of the bishop's struggles. Sharp and dangerous, said Hooper, has been my contest with that bishop. If he be restored again to his office, I shall be restored to my father, which is in heaven. But there was something to be hoped for yet on earth. The zealous reformer, who was a favored court preacher, might confess whether he cast his eyes over the diocese of the deprived prelate or turned them upon the kingdom at large. It was true that in many churches, particular masses were celebrated still under the name of communions, that the Eucharist was celebrated two or three times in some. It was true. At the priests still retained their vestments and lights before the altar. that they carefully observed their former manner of chanting, though with English, no longer in Latin. Nay, that they sang from the old service books the ancient hymns pertaining to the Eucharist. But on the other hand, there had been going on for a year or more, with the applause of the rich, a movement for substituting wooden tables for stone altars in the churches, and turning the demolished altars into pigsties or any other use of stone. Indeed, no sooner was the image war ended than the altar war began. Many strongholds had been stormed already. Large booty had been required, acquired from cloths and vessels. More remained to, be, to conquer and all was prospering. The zeal of many in the cause was remarkable. There was, for example, the eminent curate of Cree, who preferred an elm tree to a pulpit, who celebrated on a tombstone rather than approach the altar, who desired to change the names of the days of the week to keep Lent after Easter or before Shrovetide, and to rededicate the churches. Indeed, if there were any danger, it was not of lagging, but lest there should be a race who should do the extreme thing. The archbishop certainly seemed slow and spiritless, but even he had got some articles expressive of the Helvetian opinion of the sacrament to which he required all preachers and lecturers to subscribe if they would have a license. And if the bishops were too fearful of themselves and their property, yet there were six or seven of them who understood the doctrine of the Eucharist with clearness and piety. For Hooper himself, he had often withstood the Bishop of London in his turns at St. Paul's Cross. He was lecturing twice a day, sometimes for several days in succession on the Gospels and Prophets, 
And as the year fell, he had reached, as he said, the seventh chapter of the book of Daniel. In the seven, year, seven years of the reign of Edward, about 25 editions, whether of the New Testament or whole scriptures in England, English are known to have appeared. They were not new translations, footnote. These privileged altars are entirely overthrown in great part of England, and by the common consent of the higher classes are altogether abolished. Ari facti sunt harai. So wrote John Ab Ulmus at the end of 1548. Soon afterwards, Hooper himself insinuated in one of his court sermons that it would be well if it would please the magistrate to turn the altars into tables according to the first institution of Christ. Early writings. At the end of 1549, he was able to say the altars are here in many churches turned into tables. They were not new trans, okay, new trans, not new translations, but reprints of the versions of the reign of Henry, but of the standard version of Henry's later years of the great Bible, they were not all reprints. The great Bible had been indeed solemnly ordered upon the realm at the beginning of the reign in the well-known injunctions of Edward. But from the outset, it had to maintain itself against many rivals, which were brought into the field by the repeal of Henry's laws. While only four editions of the Great Bible, or Cranmer's Bible, were published by the printers Grafton and Whitchurch, the presses of the day in Ceres, a petite tiller jug poured forth quarto, octavo folio editions of the scriptures, not only with the privilege of printing, but it may be concluded with the express sanction of a committee of the Privy Council. Nothing could have indicated more strongly than these volumes, the progress of the revolution from the imaginary settlement of the late revolutionist. They contain the teaching which it had been the last act of Henry to recall and forbid under penalties. They contain the pro prologues and notes of Tyndale and others as violent as Tyndale. Some of them referred with admiration to the recent works of Bale and of Calvin. They seem to be consistent with nothing but the nakedness of Zurich and of Geneva. Listen to that imply that snub. Politely done, Dixon. The nakedness. Show me, show me something as great coming out of Zurich or Geneva, out of Canterbury there, Dixie. Those of them which contain the whole Bible were editions or recasts of that conglomerate of Tyndale and Coverdale known by the math, named Matthew's Bible, which the great Bible, when it first appeared, had in a manner superseded. Uh, a couple footnotes. An order was taken that from henceforth no printer shall print or put to vent any English book but such as shall first be examined by Mr. Secretary Peter, Mr. Secretary Smith, and Mr. Cecil, or one of them, and allowed by the same under name, 13 August, 1549. For some account of Matthew's Bible, see volume one, page 519, it bore a very important part in the Reformation. The opening one of these volumes, the reader is immediately aware of the kind of doctrine that was now in favor with the rulers of the realm. For his eye fell on the pregnant and savory table of principal matters with which Matthew's Bible was originally published. 
There he found idols and images made equivalent to abomination before God. Sacrifices, feasts, meats, all outward ceremonies, and all the order of priesthood said to be abrogated. Abstinence described as withdrawal of the Christian man from sin and any manner of mere traditions of men declared to be abuses. Baptism, it is affirmed, bringeth not grace with it. The scripture sometimes attribute that to baptism which appertaineth to faith. Begging is forbidden. There should be no beggars in the world if men kept the commandments of God. A bishop is defined as an overseer or watcher over any manner of thing whatsoever it be. The ceremonies of a Christian man are said to consist in spiritual things. The notion of free will is rejected with Calvinistic contempt. The word is not in all the Holy Scripture but is invented by fond men who would set up their own righteousness and put down the righteousness of God. Election is said to be by grace and not by works. The elect cannot be accused for as much as it is God that justify them. The word mass, the word merit is not shown in the Bible and it is added that merit is nothing. If a minister preach any works necessary for the remission of sins, he is abominable and excommunicate. While to teach that it is necessary to abstain from certain meats is the doctrine of devils. The true religion of Christ is denied to stand in diversity of habits or of vows, but in visiting the fatherless and widow, widows in their tribulation. <clears throat> the supper of the Lord is defined as a holy memory and giving of thanks for the death of Christ. The stone or rock, the foundation of the church, is the faith that one has in Christ. Under the sacrifice, it is observed that the bread and wine received in the supper of Christ are no sacrifice. The priest was accidentally or in contempt omitted in the alphabetical order and put after sacrifice to yield the remark that the order of priesthood is translated, that is to say abolished, ceased and finished in such wise as they need now be no more for we are all priests of God. In the annotations also which this volume contain, there are some pithy enlargements and improvements of things present in the explication of things. Thus, on the precept of Samuel that to obey is better than sacrifice, to obey what? It was demanded. Man's inventions, man's dreams or traditions, nay, verily but God's holy word and his blessed commandments. Yea, and to obey them is better than to offer sacrifices which are not commanded, ordained, and appointed of God himself. How much better is it than our offerings which are invented without God's word or any mention made thereof in all of Scripture? David's prayer, attend unto my cry, gave rise to the distinction, not the roaring in the choir, but the instant and effects of prayer when the whole heart goeth with all. On the institution of the sacrament in St. Matthew, it was observed that three opinions were held. The sort be they who say he neither pointed to his own body nor yet turned the bread into his own body, but spoke of the bread, calling it his body by signification, as if he had said, this body being broken, divided among you, and eaten of you, signifieth unto you my body, which shall be broken for you. These men are called heretics, but indeed are true Christians. 
in these publications, in short, the voices of the former heretics swelled to the accents of authority and the license of the realm was exercised to insult the institutions of the church. To Mr. P Pocock, the editor of Burnett, belongs the credit of first indicating the design of these publications. In his tract, The Principles of the Reformation, he says, at the same time, a more effectual method of disseminating Zwinglian and Calvinistic opinions was taken by reiterated issues of the New Testament in small portable form with passages selected for epistles and gospels, specially marked for use in the church and with notes at the end of each chapter reprinted from Matthew Henry's Matthew's Bible of 1537, full of the sole Fidian doctrine and of attacks upon sacramental grace, as well as demonstrations that the Bishop of Rome is Antichrist. These were repeatedly issued in rapid succession all through the reign down to the year of 1552 when an important change took place. This change was the publication of the New Testament in 1552 with new notes far more Calvinistic than Zwinglian. I am obliged to Mr. Pocock for the use of his unpublished notes on Day, the Day and Serres folio with the help of Mr. Fry's Tyndale and the Bodleian Library, I have attempted the following descriptive list of the Edwardian Bibles, but I cannot say that it is perfect. Uh, 1547, New Testament, English of Tyndale, Latin of Erasmus, no contents nor notes to chapters printed by license. 1528, 1548, Tyndale, Tyndale, another notes of original Tyndale, 1534 in this edition, in the margin and ends of chapters. And he's got some more here, editions, Froschauer, no prologues, epistles taken out, Qualtier, White Church, we will call that to an end. Let us pray. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without 